Uh, all right, uh, this is a continuation of uh, remedial law. Under the amendment to the 1997 Rules of Civil Procedure, effective May 1, 2020, uh, amending Rule 15, uh, Section 12, a motion to dismiss as a general rule is a prohibited pleading. Uh, except on the following grounds. Lack of jurisdiction over the subject matter, litis uh, pendencia, pendency of another action between the same parties on the same cause of action, and then uh, barred by prior judgment res judicata and uh, barred by uh, statute of limitations. I uh, an objection based on uh, improper venue uh, may not be taken in a motion to dismiss. It may be taken in the answer and a preliminary hearing on the special and affirmative defenses may be uh, requested. Where uh, a motion based on uh, the allowed grounds I have mentioned uh, has been filed, an opposition must be filed within five days without any order of the court to do so. And the motion to dismiss shall be resolved by the court within 15 days from receipt of the opposition or expiry of the 15 days. The court has discretion whether to hold for a hearing or not. The denial of affirmative defense is not subject to uh, motion for reconsideration, petition for certiorari mandamus uh, under Rule 65, and uh, may be appealed only after the judgment on the merits because interlocutory, uh, uh, I, I mean interlocutory order uh, must await the uh, judgment on the merit and may be appealed together with the uh, main decision. However, uh, a special civil action of uh, certiorari uh, may be allowed except in these instances where uh, the uh, petition for certiorari is not uh, allowed or prohibited. For example, in uh, the revised uh, rules of criminal procedure, the denial of the murder to evidence is not uh, uh, appealable. However, uh, and uh, it is also prohibited to uh, file a, an original action of certiorari under Rule 65 against an order denying uh, the moral to evidence. However, the Supreme Court has discretionary authority to entertain a, an original petition for review under five based on lack of jurisdiction, although it is prohibited under the internal rules of the uh, Sandigan Bayan to appeal by rather to raise the issue on certiorari under Rule 45. That is explicitly prohibited in the rules of the Sandigan Bayan. However, in the case of uh, Gloria Magapagal Arroyo, the Supreme Court entertained a special civil action of certiorari based on lack of jurisdiction, questioning the denial of uh, her demurrer to evidence. The justification for this is that uh, even in the absence of uh, a rule allowing a petition for review on certiorari for grave abuse of discretion or uh, lack of uh, jurisdiction, it is a remedy in equity uh, against uh, the abuses of law. 
we are both a court of law or equity where uh, the uh, uh, implementation of the law is tainted with grave abuse of uh, discretion or is uh, tainted with uh, lack of jurisdiction, then even without uh, a, a remedy so provided, it is a remedy in equity which is enshrined in uh, Section 1, Article uh, 8 of the Constitution that the Supreme Court has the power of judicial review over acts done in excess of uh, jurisdiction or uh, with grave abuse of uh, discretion uh, over acts done by the executive department or uh, the uh, legislative department, their agencies or instrumentalities. So even if it is a prohibited pleading, uh, uh, to uh, seek a review uh, for interlocutory order uh, as uh, prohibited by uh, internal rules of the various uh, bodies, the Supreme Court has the power under Section 1, uh, Rule 8 to entertain the petition, as was done in the case of uh, uh, Gloria Mapagal Arroyo and also the case of uh, Senator Juan Ponce Enrique. I believe that the, the, the petition, oh never mind that, uh, let, let me just uh, go ahead and uh, proceed. Now, uh, the dismissal uh, on the following grounds raised in a motion to dismiss are final and may not be refiled. Uh, based on the affirmative defenses on the grounds of uh, bar by prior judgment or uh, barred by statute of limitations, the claim has been paid, waived, abandoned or otherwise uh, extinguished. Correlating this to uh, criminal law, after the arraignment, there are still grounds that may be raised in a motion to dismiss. And these are uh, the information does not allege or does not charge an offense. Uh, in case of uh, latest pendentia, meaning that uh, there is uh, another action pending on the same issue and subject matter. And uh, double jeopardy, uh, that is uh, barred by prior uh, judgment. Or uh, where uh, the crime is barred by prescription of uh, action or extinguished uh, by uh, prescription. This may still be uh, the subject of a motion to quash if, even after arraignment. Most uh, important of which is lack of jurisdiction over the subject matter which may be raised for the first time on appeal. Uh, the only exception is the case of Tiham uh, versus uh, Sibong Hanoi where affirmative reliefs uh, have uh, been uh, uh, prayed for by the by a party, he cannot uh, raise the issue of lack of jurisdiction by reason of uh, estoppel. By his uh, acts, he may uh, be considered as having waived his right to uh, raise the issue of lack of jurisdiction. However, uh, this is uh, a very narrow exception to the general rule that uh, lack of jurisdiction may be raised at any stage of the proceedings, even on appeal. Because uh, in, in one case where uh, the issue was uh, raised uh, immediately 
or was raised uh, uh, without uh, any indication of waiver uh, on the part of uh, the per, uh, person raising lack of jurisdiction. Because Tiham versus Sibung Hanoi, uh, there must, in Tiham versus Sibung Hanoi, there must be a uh, uh, failure to, to raise it even if uh, affirmative reliefs are prayed for, if the uh, acts may be considered as a uh, waiver by estoppel in Paes due to long period of inaction. In other words, it must be coupled with latches. But the general rule is jurisdiction may be raised at any stage of the proceedings. Last time, I uh, mentioned that uh, the established uh, case law is that uh, jurisdiction once acquired continues until the final termination and conclusion of the case. And I raised the issue whether uh, the amendatory uh, law expanding the jurisdiction of the first level court uh, in uh, real action where the uh, assessed value in the tax declaration uh, does not exceed 400,000 uh, or the claim for uh, damages or sum of money does not exceed uh, 2 million, uh, then the lower court, uh, rather the first level court, uh, has exclusive jurisdiction. And the question I pose is, has this uh, uh, law retroactive application? Last time, uh, uh, taking into account the practice of uh, most uh, RTC judges to remand the case, I said that uh, it might be considered uh, curative and might be given retroactive effect. I made a further research and uh, this is now my final answer, which I posted in my uh, Facebook account as a Makbar, uh, uh, examina uh, Makbar examination question. And the answer now is no, because the law is uh, a substantive law. Why? Because it defines jurisdiction, and jurisdiction is uh, defined or fixed by law, and therefore it is a substantive law. And uh, the uh, Supreme Court issued a circular uh, to the RTC judges where uh, uh, cases uh, below uh, 400 in the assess value or uh, in the claim below uh, 2 million for a sum of money, the RTC judges shall continue with the case uh, uh, filed uh, before uh, April 21, 2021. So that was the cut off the effectivity of the new law. So the answer is it should not be given retroactive effect. Now, what uh, would be the effect of uh, cases transferred already to the uh, first level court uh, before the uh, effectivity of the Supreme Court uh, circular? I would uh, imagine that uh, the circular would not be given retroactive effect and uh, the MTC uh, probably can, uh, can continue. But this is still an open question because jurisdiction is vested by law. And uh, the directive of the Supreme Court is uh, for uh, RTC judges to continue with the cases uh, 
filed uh, before uh, April 21, 2021. Now, if a case is filed before April 21, 2021, and uh, the uh, assessed value in the tax declaration is uh, 400,000 uh, or below, and it is now in the uh, RTC, MTC rather, what is the effect? There might be lack of jurisdiction. Then probably, uh, this is my opinion, the uh, MTC court should uh, forward the case uh, with respect to cases filed after uh, April 21, 2021. But uh, that is only my opinion. We will be guided by the syllabus. So let me see. I made uh, some notes for this lecture. So let us uh, finish uh, evidence uh, which uh, was barely touched in the last hearing and then the part two of the uh, remedial law uh, and then uh, legal ethics and then uh, we will uh, deal with uh, Makbar questions that I prepared. Under the rule of evidence, the equipoise rule provides uh, is to the effect that uh, where uh, inculpatory facts, facts in favor of the plaintiff or the prosecution, and the exculpatory facts facts in favor of the uh, defendant or in, in civil case or the accused in a criminal case are on equipos, meaning that the facts may uh, be interpreted uh, in favor of the plaintiff or the prosecution at the same level on equipos with the facts uh, that uh, might be appreciated in favor of the defendant or the uh, accused, then the accused is entitled, entitled to uh, an acquittal. Uh, uh, number one, it is uh, the duty of the prosecution to uh, hurdle the presumption of innocence by presenting evidence proving the guilt of the accused beyond reasonable doubt. And uh, in case, uh, in a civil case, it is the duty of the, uh, uh, it is the duty of the uh, plaintiff to prove by preponderance of evidence uh, his uh, causes of action. Now, uh, the defense is entitled, uh, the, the defense uh, in, in a, the defendant in a civil case, even without presenting evidence, if the plaintiff has not uh, 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 proven the burden by preponderance of evidence to establish his claim, then uh, the uh, uh, plaintiff, even in case of default, where no evidence is presented by the defendant, would not be entitled to a judgment. The same case uh, for an accused, 
because an accused has the right to remain silent and has a right against self-incrimination. Now, under uh, the revised rules, in the pre-trial stage, an accused is supposed to submit uh, or, or mark the evidence and uh, to submit a judicial affidavit. I tested this in uh, a case that I was handling in the Sandigan Bayan. And I said that uh, it is unconstitutional to require an accused to submit an affidavit, a judicial affidavit of his defense at the pre-marking and uh, at the uh, pre-trial because an accused has the right to remain silent and an accused has the right against self-incrimination. Now, if before the presentation of evidence for the prosecution, you are a defense counsel and you already uh, submit a judicial affidavit containing your defenses. You will be bound by your admission without even uh, uh, seeing all the evidence and all the, without uh, even hearing all the uh, testimonies of the prosecution. Under the Constitution, uh, an accused of a crime has the right to remain silent and has the right to against self-incrimination. Uh, in other words, he is not compelled to, to testify. And uh, the purpose of a judicial affidavit is uh, to take the place of uh, direct examination. I was uh, sustained by the Sandi Gambaya and uh, was required to submit the judicial affidavit only if I chose to present evidence because an accused has the right to file demurrer to evidence. But uh, we have to be very careful uh, upon the uh, when the prosecution rests, then uh, immediately we defense counsel should file the murder to evidence. And the first thing to file is a uh, motion for leave to file the murder to evidence. And uh, once, once that is uh, granted, then uh, the demurrer to evidence might be filed. And uh, the better practice is to attach already the demurrer to evidence because the uh, general rule is that uh, motion to admit a pleading requires that the uh, pleading be already attached. While I am in uh, criminal law, let us correlate that uh, uh, requirement. Under the guidelines for uh, speedy trial in criminal cases, a motion for judicial determination of probable cause in a criminal case is a prohibited pleading because the rules require that upon receipt of the information within uh, uh, 10 days from receipt of the uh, information together with the findings, resolution and findings in the preliminary investigation, the judge must determine the existence of probable cause Personally, by uh, examining uh, the evidence submitted during the preliminary investigation, it must be based on personal evaluation, personal determination of the judge, because the judge cannot rely merely on the resolution 
finding probable cause. Uh, that is judicial determination of probable cause for the purpose of issuing a uh, warrant of arrest. If the judge does not uh, find probable cause based on his personal review of the evidence, he is under mandatory duty. He must dismiss the information and not issue uh, a warrant of arrest. He issues a warrant of arrest only if he is convinced that there is probable cause. In case uh, he is ambivalent, there is doubt in his mind whether there is probable cause or not, then the, uh, the judge may require the prosecuting fiscal to submit additional evidence and then he will uh, determine the existence of uh, probable cause. And if still he believes that there is no probable cause, then he has uh, no choice. It is his uh, obligatory duty under the Constitution to uh, dismiss the case and not issue uh, a warrant of arrest. I have an experience uh, where uh, a gate crusher brandishing a gun wanted to enter uh, the junior senior prom in my uh, uh, school in my hometown in San Jose, Batangas. The owner of the uh, uh, school called for police uh, assistance or police uh, protection. Five police officers came. Uh, one of the uh, police officer shot the intruder. They were uh, prosecuted for uh, murder because uh, shooting uh, somebody who is uh, defenseless is murder. It was uh, proven during the preliminary investigation that the gun being brandished uh, by the gate crusher had empty uh, shells. And so uh, shooting him uh, <coughs> uh, was considered as uh, attendant with treachery. The shooter uh, went into hiding and I defended the four others. My defense is that there is no conspiracy because there was uh, no prior planning and uh, the four did not know uh, what uh, the shooter would do. And uh, mere presence in the scene would not uh, be enough to hold them in conspiracy because conspiracy is defined as uh, two or more persons deciding to commit a crime or planning to commit a crime and they decide to commit it. Uh, which, which is not uh, present. And uh, in the absence of uh, planning, uh, duly uh, proven under express uh, conspiracy, then uh, conspiracy may be established by the unity of purpose through the contributory overt acts towards the accomplishment of uh, a common criminal design, uh, which is not present. I filed a motion for judicial determination, uh, which was not prohibited yet at that time, and I was uh, sustained by the RTC. This is a crime committed by public officer. And uh, the preliminary investigation was conducted by the Provincial uh, Fiscal's Office. My practice, most of my practice, about 80%, uh, 
uh, was in the office of the Ombudsman and the Santigang Bayan. Why? Because the, the grass is greener in that uh, practice. Uh, most of our clients were government officials who can uh, afford uh, to pay us a uh, good uh, attorney's fees. So I, I kept quiet. And uh, when the case uh, came to, when the information was filed, uh, I did not even bother to file uh, a counter affidavit because I might be uh, considered under estoppel. Knowing that uh, the appeal for crimes committed by public officer were the imposable uh, uh, penalty falls within the jurisdiction of the uh, uh, RTC because the salary grade is below 70 and uh, the imposable penalty uh, corresponds to the penalty uh, imposable by the RTC. Now, if the penalty corresponds to the penalty imposable by the MTC that is not exceeding uh, prison uh, correctional uh, six months maximum, then the jurisdiction would fall under the MTC. The Office of the Provincial Fiscal uh, appealed by certiorari under uh, Rule 65 to the Supreme Court. I kept quiet. I did not even file any comment. The Supreme Court, probably unaware of the uh, jurisdiction on appeal that should have been to the Sandigan Bayan, issued a resolution directing the provincial fiscal to submit additional evidence. I kept quiet. The provincial fiscal submitted uh, additional evidence to prove uh, the existence of uh, probable cause. The judge was not uh, convinced despite the additional evidence and the case was uh, dismissed against the four uh, responding uh, police officer. That was a celebrated case in my hometown in San Jose uh, in my younger years of uh, uh, practice. So the pay attention to jurisdictions because uh, any misstep on matter of jurisdiction is fatal to the case because uh, I can still raise that for the first time on appeal if I uh, would not fall under the Tiham versus Sibong Hanoi where uh, there is uh, Stoppel in Paes and uh, Laches. The only exception to uh, the rule that jurisdiction may be raised at any stage of the proceedings. Still another uh, experience where uh, jurisdiction uh, became a very uh, successful defense for a client. In the gubernatorial uh, election in uh, Quirino province, where the protagonist is uh, Vargas against uh, uh, Alvaro Antonio, respondent who won the gubernatorial election. So I, uh, uh, I, I protest was filed in the RTC. 
Alvaro Antonio won. Then an appeal to the Supreme Court was uh, made by the losing gubernatorial candidate. The COMELEC affirmed the decision on the protest, uh, dismissing the protest. So what is the remedy? The remedy under Rule 64 is a petition for review to the uh, Supreme Court in Bank. And uh, under Rule 64, allowing appeal from the adverse resolution of the COMELEC and uh, the Commission on Audit, the period to file the petition is not 15 days, it is 30 days. Making a mistake that it was 15 days, the council uh, for the losing party, uh, now Senator uh, Laila de Lima, made a mistake that uh, it was uh, 15 days as in uh, uh, Rule 45 and Rule 65. So she filed a motion for 30 days extension counted from uh, expiry of 15 days within which to file the petition by way of an appeal from the COMELEC to the Supreme Court. And so it happened that uh, she filed the case outside the 30 days period. Uh, actually, uh, uh, within the 45 days, that is 30 days uh, extension on the 15, 45. And that is beyond 30 days under Rule 64. And the Supreme Court uh, dismissed the case for being filed out of time. Th th that's why uh, Remedial law is very important. We have discussed last time uh, hierarchy of uh, courts, but uh, let me just uh, explain a little bit on uh, judicial non-interference. Uh, what is the meaning of uh, judicial non-interference? It simply means that uh, a court of equal jurisdiction cannot interfere in the action, orders, or resolution, or decision of uh, a co-equal uh, body which, uh, wh whose uh, decisions are, uh, are appealable. Uh, to the same uh, appellate uh, body. That is the uh, principle of judicial non-interference. Now, uh, hierarchy of courts. I cannot forget this because I won a case on, uh, a, a, a very big case on uh, this technicality, where uh, the uh, appeal was supposed to be to the Court of Appeals, but uh, was made directly to the Supreme Court on question of law. So when the petition was filed directly with the Supreme Court, I just kept quiet. I did not file anything. The case uh, involves uh, a loan initially fixed at uh, 3 million. But uh, because of interest and penalties that have piled up, the demand uh, amounted to a total of uh, 103 million pesos. an increase of 100 uh, million. The case 
because uh, it is uh, a problematic uh, account was sold by the bank to a special purpose vehicle corporation. And uh, the special purpose vehicle corporation filed a case in Makati to recover 103 uh, billion. At that time, I was uh, the uh, resource speaker of uh, a, a group that was holding seminar on uh, uh, transactions uh, with the banks. And, and uh, so uh, Miguel Vasquez, uh, who was uh, indebted uh, now, who was the dependent now in the uh, action for uh, collection by the assignee uh, special purpose vehicle uh, corporation, uh, was among those who attended my seminar. And he came to my office. And I advised him, this is what we should do. We you should file uh, a motion for uh, consignation before the uh, RTC of Makati. You make a tender and then you uh, consign the amount in court, the original amount under Article 1634. And, uh, what is Article 1634? Where an item in litigation, a choice in action, is sold during the pendency of the lit litigation, the uh, borrower has the right of equity of preemption or redemption by paying only the transfer price and reasonable cost of money. And so that is what the uh, attorney Miguel Vasquez did. The Regional Trial Court of Magati sustained our position. The consignation was accepted and the case was dismissed. I will not mention the lawyer, a big law firm in Magati handled the case for Bank of Commerce and filed uh, an appeal on pure question of law under Rule 45 to the, directly to the Supreme Court. I kept quiet because I have read in the course of my uh, uh, teaching in uh, remittance law review and in the course of my practice about the hierarchy of courts. And true enough, the Supreme Court dismissed the case on the ground that uh, under the hierarchy of courts, resort first must have been taken to the Court of Appeals. And uh, There is a statement, a procedural misstep in the law of uh, procedure is fatal to the cause of the petitioner. Motion for reconsideration denied. And so we, we won the case. Unfortunately, my client died while he was participating in a decathlon in Bicol. He, he drowned while swimming in the course of the decathlon uh, sports. In relation to uh, judicial affidavit uh, rule, please remember that uh, the rule is applicable in all courts, including the Municipal Trial Court, where a judicial affidavit is uh, allowed 
to be submitted in lieu of uh, direct examination or even in the municipal uh, uh, level where uh, it is covered by the rule on summary procedure. I handled a case for uh, unlawful detainer. Now, uh, the plaintiff submitted only plain affidavit uh, to prove the causes of action attached to the uh, complaint. When uh, the complaint for unlawful detainer was filed, the judicial affidavit rule was already in effect. I got a dismissal of, uh, I would say, a very big case because the amount, uh, the subject matter of the case is adjacent to the public market in San Jose. Uh, that is ideal for uh, for SM or other uh, big uh, malls to establish. The lower court dismissed the petition on the sole ground that the judicial affidavit rule was not uh, complied with. And therefore, the cause of action of the uh, uh, plaintiff was not established by the simple affidavit because the judicial affidavit rule is applicable even to the first level court in uh, summary proceedings. So the, uh, the judge, I do not even know him personally, dismissed the case without even looking at our defense. Our defense is uh, the, my, my client has been there for the past 50 years as tenant. And uh, I got uh, a certification from the park chairman that indeed they were tenants. But the judge uh, did not even consider my defenses and dismissed the case on the technicality that uh, the judicial affidavit rule was not complied with in an unlawful detainer case under summary procedure uh, because the judicial affidavit rule is applicable to all levels. Uh, to courts of all levels. And so that is very important. Now, uh, while we are under uh, civil procedure, the pleadings that are required to be verified in any courts. Uh, where verification is required. For example, even in uh, first level court, in uh, forcible entry and unlawful detainer cases, uh, the pleadings must be verified. Uh, not only the pleadings, but uh, all other uh, submissions must be verified. In, in one uh, bar examination, uh, it was asked, what are the pleadings recognized by the rules of court? So uh, you uh, read what are the, what are the pleadings, uh, complaint, answer, uh, third party claim, uh, counter claim, cross claim, uh, complaint and intervention, Answer in intervention, supplemental complaint, uh, answer to third party complaint. Now, a motion is not a pleading. But if uh, all the pleadings and other uh, filings uh, where uh, reliefs are being sought, like a motion, is required to be verified, as in uh, summary proceedings before the first level court, 
and uh, in uh, petition uh, filed with the uh, Supreme Court or the Court of Appeals, where uh, the petition must be accompanied with verification and uh, uh, non-forum certification. The new rules uh, have uh, additional requirements. Now, it is better that you comply those who are practitioners, and this might be asked in the bar, to include in the verification. If you are required to file a complaint, then a verification, uh, it, it, uh, it has to be verified by the uh, plaintiff or, or the defendant or by the, uh, by the lawyer uh, because the signature of the lawyer constitutes a certification of uh, many warranties and it is better that that is already uh, included or attached as verified by uh, the uh, client and the lawyer. And what are these? Uh, additional uh, allegations that must be uh, made in the verification. Otherwise, if you file a petition in the uh, Court of Appeals and uh, it is not compliant with the new verification, you might be required to comply first before your uh, petition or uh, motion for TRO or uh, any uh, urgent uh, motion may be acted upon by the court. And uh, these uh, are the verifications that are required to be made by the uh, petitioner. In addition to, I have read the uh, pleading, uh, number two, to the best of my knowledge, information and belief formed after the inquiry reasonable under the circumstances that, so these are uh, the additional. It is not being presented for any improper purpose such as to harass, cause unnecessary delay, or needlessly increase the cost of litigation. The claims, defenses, and other legal contentions are warranted by existing law or jurisprudence, or by a non frivolous argument for extending, modifying, or reversing existing jurisprudence. You are not precluded from uh, departing from established jurisprudence uh, for as long as uh, you have justifiable uh, reason. In uh, my cases uh, involving uh, real estate mortgages, the continuing uh, blanket provision in real estate mortgage and even in uh, uh, joint and several undertakings. The clause saying that uh, this uh, security, real estate mortgage or JSS agreement, stands as security for past, present and future loans. I am questioning that in my uh, uh, cases because I believe that uh, to subject future loans to the same security violates the requirements of a valid contract under the civil code because under the law of contract there must be an agreement uh, between the parties on the object certain and the consideration. Now, future loans 
Remember that uh, a mortgage is only an accessory uh, obligation. And that uh, a JSS agreement is uh, only a security arrangement. It is an accessory uh, undertaking. Is there uh, object certain when the loans have not been extended? So to me, uh, uh, agreement to secure future loans that has not been extended, which may or may not be extended, violates the second requisite that the meeting of the mind is on an object uh, certain. And then number three, on the consideration. What is the consideration of an accessory obligation? The loan. And if the loan has not been extended because it is to be extended in the future, then there is no consideration for the accessory contract. Because an, a, a contract which is accessory in nature, like a real estate mortgage, cannot exist independently of the principal obligation secured thereby. And uh, what is the consideration? The loan is the consideration of the mortgage. And so I am questioning that. And uh, a continuing surety agreement also has the same fatal uh, compliance with the requisites of a valid contract. Now, this has not been raised before, and I am raising it for the first time. Although uh, it may not have retroactive effect, then th th there is no uh, prohibition in exercising your creative uh, imagination. And as long as uh, your arguments are based on logic and uh, uh, it is based on uh, logical analysis of the requirements of the law, then you might not be uh, considered uh, uh, raising a frivolous issue. Uh, by for deviating from established jurisprudence, because uh, the law is uh, is fluid, and there is uh, this inter interpretation, uh, one of the uh, coverage under the rule of evidence is uh, interpretation. We have uh, two kinds of uh, interpretation of the provisions of law. One is uh, verbalehis. You apply the law where uh, there is, uh, it is clear. The opposite is uh, anima dehis. Now, in the Constitution, and uh, we will uh, consider this in the next uh, uh, session next week on uh, political law. The, there is ambiguity in the uh, provision of the Constitution, whether uh, the amendments to the Constitution by uh, Constituent Assembly is uh, by three-fourths vote of each House voting separately or in a joint session assemble, not voting separately. If you read the literal language, it is in a joint session where uh, the interpretation may be uh, uh, per capita, 24 against 200 per capita. However, uh, if we consider the intent of the Constitution as borne by previous provisions in the preceding Constitutions, then the idea is uh, the voting should be by each house uh, voting separately. Now, uh, under the principle that the philosophy or the intent must prevail over the writ literal interpretation, then uh, that might be the correct interpretation. Each house voting separately.
because it would be anomalous for an independent house to have only 14 votes as against 20 votes of the lower house. The issue has not been resolved. When uh, Pantaleon Alvarez was uh, having a quarrel with the Senate on the correct interpretation, I, I filed a petition for declaratory relief with the Supreme Court uh, to defuse the tension. In my capacity as uh, a professor, uh, a civic-minded uh, citizen, and a taxpayer, And so I am asking the Supreme Court to declare which is which. Under the uh, special civil action uh, under uh, Rule 65 on declaratory relief to uh, declare the rights and obligations uh, under the Constitution. Now, a declaratory relief is available to declare the rights and obligations under a will, contract, executive order, and uh, it is uh, a special civil action which is summary in nature. There is no hearing, just the submission of uh, uh, memoranda. The Supreme Court denied my petition on the ground that, uh, number one, I am not equipped with legal personality because I share my uh, interest only with the general public and not, uh, I am not personally affected. I do not stand uh, personally to uh, benefit or be injured. So I was uh, not, I was considered not uh, a party with uh, sufficient legal interest to file the petition. The Supreme Court has uh, made uh, recently. Uh, I more uh, strict stand than before because before I have filed many public interest cases where uh, my petition was uh, given due course by the Supreme Court. During uh, the initial Marcos administration, I filed a petition to disclose based on the provision of the Constitution on the right of the public to information on government transactions affecting public interest. My petition was uh, given due course. This was at the early part of martial law. However, I was uh, teaching at the UP College of Law and I filed a motion to, uh, to reset, even for uh, two or three days or one week, the oral argument because I did not want to miss my deadline to submit my grades in the uh, UP College of Law. The court denied my petition, uh, my motion for uh, to reset and they uh, proceeded with the hearing where uh, my sparring partner then, uh, Tito Mendoza, uh, appeared and argued before the Supreme Court in bank without me. And I was uh, castigated, or not castigated, I was uh, admonished to choose between teaching and law practice because uh, the deadline in the submission of the grades in UP is not sufficient excuse to reset an oral argument before the uh, Supreme Court. And so I, I missed the uh, 
opportunity to argue orally. And I do not know what happened to that case. Uh, maybe it was not uh, resolved. There was another case which I argued in the Supreme Court, and that was at the initial uh, proclamation of martial law in 1972. My, uh, my Nino, my uh, wedding godfather, Justice uh, Manuel Lopez uh, Inahe, was removed by President Marcos for being notoriously undesirable in view of the many cases filed against him. And uh, that was done during martial law. I, we filed a petition in the Supreme Court on the ground that uh, the dismissal is unconstitutional because there was no due process and uh, he has not been proven uh, to be guilty in any of the many charges uh, filed against him. And uh, during the oral argument, I was uh, saying that uh, due process hears before it condemns and proceeds to render decision only after trial as a matter of due process. The Chief Justice was uh, Justice Fernando who was uh, teaching with us in the UP College of Law. And uh, I was quoting uh, from his book, an old book, that uh, removal of a public official requires uh, clear and convincing, uh, uh, clear and convincing evidence of uh, the offense committed. And uh, while uh, proof beyond reasonable doubt is required, it is very close to the requirement of proof beyond reasonable doubt, as handed by the Supreme Court in an old case. And he said, Counsel, your uh, citation might be obsolete. That's a very old book. Whose book is that? And I said, Your Honor. This book is written by the leading authority on constitutional law. This is your book, Your Honor. But anyway, uh, we were co-professors in the UP College of Law at that time. And then uh, one time he asked me, you read the provision of the Constitution. And I said, if I am not yet a good lawyer, I must be a good reader. I will read it for you. And then he said, even in reading, you are not good enough. But anyway, I know that uh, he was kidding. Because uh, in the school, uh, much later he said, if not for the political underpinnings, I think you should uh, win that case. Now, what happened to that case? Before martial law was lifted, my Ninong judge, uh, Manuel Lopez uh, Inahe was uh, recruited by President Marcos to be a presidential advisor in Malacanang. And so uh, we did not uh, pursue the case anymore. And uh, when I was requested to file separation pay, I did not accept the case anymore. So, par pa pardon me if uh, I am reminiscing. Uh, my uh, experience in the Supreme Court in Bank. I am tempted to discuss uh, tr uh, three or uh, four uh, cases that I won, but uh, that uh, would be immaterial. And uh, So let me just uh, proceed. Now, the 
signature of a lawyer in a pleading or uh, even a motion or any submission before the court uh, must uh, uh, rather constitute a certification of similar uh, <coughs> warranties that uh, the factual allegations are supported by evidence and if specifically uh, specified uh, would be supported by uh, uh, evidence upon uh, availment of mode of uh, discovery. Now, let me continue on the required uh, allegations in the verification of the party. So, here is the uh, verification required of a party. I am one, I, I am one, or I am the plaintiff or the petitioner in the above entitled case. I have caused the preparation and read the foregoing pleading, the contents of which are true and correct of my own knowledge and or based on authentic records and documents. The allegations therein are uh, true and correct based on personal knowledge or authentic records. The pleadings are not filed to harass, cause unnecessary delay, or needlessly increase the cost of litigation. The factual allegations therein have evidentiary support, or if specifically so identified, will likewise have evidentiary support after reasonable opportunity for discovery. My signature shall further serve as a certification of the truthfulness of the allegations in the pleading. So subscribe and sworn to uh, by the uh, by the party. Now the lawyer's uh, certificate in compliance with Section Three of Administrative Order Nineteen Ten uh, Twenty Supreme Court Twenty Nineteen uh, Amendments to the Rules of Civil Procedure. I. Arturo M. De Castro, of legal age married and with office at the uh, seventh floor LTA uh, building. Under oath, hereby depose and state, I am the counsel in uh, docketed in entitled and uh, etc. And my signature below. constitutes my uh, certification that I have read the motion, I have read the pleading to the best of my knowledge, information and belief formed after an inquiry reasonable under the circumstances that one, it is not presented for any improper purpose such as to harass, cause unnecessary delay or needlessly increase the cost of uh, litigation. The claims, defenses, and other contentions are warranted by existing law or jurisprudence or by non prebulous argument for extending, modifying, or reversing existing jurisprudence. Here, I, I say that uh, as long as you have logical and reasonable basis for deviating from uh, Starry decisis. You will not be uh, cited in contempt. And this is very important because uh, a lawyer who will file a plainly frivolous uh, and unfounded suit is uh, liable under the rule on ethics not to sue upon groundless or unlawful suit. That is part of the lawyer's oath. And uh, we will go to uh, legal ethics later on. You should be able to 
state verbatim if you are required to recite or state the lawyer's oath. And uh, in most uh, bar questions in legal ethics, that is frequently asked. Why? Because uh, the duties of uh, fiduciary duties of a lawyer are spelled out in the uh, uh, lawyer's oath. Duty to society, duty to the court, duty to uh, fellow practitioners, and duty to the clients. And uh, very important uh, signification of a signature of the lawyer is the factual contentions have evidentiary support or if it is specifically so identified will likely have evidentiary support after availment of the modes of discovery under the rules. So suing upon a groundless or unlawful suit is a violation of the lawyer's oath and may be uh, punished under the law on uh, professional ethics. And then the denials of factual contentions are warranted on the evidence or if specifically so identified are reasonably based on belief or lack of information. So those are uh, the lawyer certification and uh, the signature of a lawyer signifies those warranties for which the lawyer, if there is any falsity, would be liable for a uh, breach of uh, ethics. And it would be a better practice to just uh, put that lawyer certification in every pleading that uh, we file. Although the rule says uh, the signature of a lawyer constitutes uh, the, follow the following certification and uh, it would be a better practice to just uh, include those certification in the, to, to be attached to the pleadings and uh, together with the required verification of the uh, uh, party or witness. Now, verification by a lawyer who has no personal knowledge is not sufficient verification. It must be based on personal uh, knowledge. Before we you know, I am tempted to uh, repeat what uh, I have emphasized uh, last time on uh, joinder of parties. Remember that uh, it is now subject only to joinder of uh, joinder of causes of action are uh, allowed as long as joinder of parties are uh, present. Uh, and I repeat, causes of action arising from the same transaction or series of transactions that uh, present common uh, question of facts or law. That is the only requirement. Uh, causes of action belonging to different venues and different jurisdictions might be joined, but you file it in the RTC uh, based on the totality of the claims. Where uh, parties may be joined. Now, joinder of uh, causes of action.
under uh, a loan agreement, uh, several promissory notes were issued. Or uh, under uh, the same real estate mortgage, collaterals in different venues were uh, the subject of uh, real estate mortgage. So, these several causes of action uh, might be joined. Even if the real estate mortgage uh, for one promissory note is located in uh, another province. But then, uh, the totality of the demand determines jurisdiction. And you can file it uh, in any uh, RTC. If, uh, for example, uh, one uh, promissory note uh, is uh, below 200, is, is below 2 million, uh, still that can be joined as long as the case is filed with the RTC. Now, joinder of parties. Several uh, employees were dismissed by the same uh, employer. Then uh, they, they can join uh, causes of action. Let us say uh, the employers are, are officers of the corporation. Because uh, if they are uh, laborers, then uh, I do not know if we can uh, have gender of parties before the uh, Department of Labor. But uh, where, for example, the dismissed uh, employees were officers, so that might uh, fall under the uh, jurisdiction of the Special Commercial Court. So you can join uh, the parties who were uh, dismissed by the same uh, plaintiff uh, corporation because uh, the dismissal arose from the same uh, transaction or series of transactions of dismissal provided that uh, common questions of facts or of law are uh, raised or presented. Now, the opposite of joinder uh, of causes of action is splitting a single cause of action. And what is the effect of splitting a single cause of action? The cause of action that is left when uh, a portion of a cause of action is filed in court, the remaining uh, cause of, uh, part of the cause of action that is not included is deemed released or waived. Now, let us have an example of that. Uh, loan covered by uh, real estate mortgage. The, the loan or the promissory note and the real estate mortgage constitute a single cause of action. So where an action for a sum of money to enforce the loan is filed without foreclosing the real estate mortgage, then the uh, mortgage is released because the mortgage is part of a single cause of action together with the loan. Mortgage being only an accessory obligation that cannot exist independently of the loan, which is the consideration of the uh, accessory obligation of uh, mortgage. 
Another example of splitting a single cause of action. Under a loan agreement where uh, loans may be obtained separately, independently, on separate occasion, under the same loan agreement. And uh, loans are, uh, are uh, applied for and then paid, and applied for and then paid, and let us say that several uh, promissory notes to, were executed to cover several availments under the same uh, loan agreement. Where, uh, for example, uh, the complaint joins all the causes of action, then it is the totality of the claim that is the subject matter. What is the effect of splitting a single cause of action if only one or two or several promissory notes are the subject of a collection suit? excluding the other uh, loans. Uh, if you can show that uh, the different loans, the, the different promissory notes, constitute a single cause of action under the loan agreement, then suing on one or some of the promissory notes will release or discharge the other promissory notes under the rule against splitting a single cause of action. Now, in, uh, let, let us uh, go to evidence. Let us finish first uh, the coverage of remedial law one. The the best evidence, the common objection is uh, if uh, the transaction is covered by a contract and uh, the contents of the evidence the contents of the inquiry or issue or rather uh, the bone of contention is the contents of the contract the best evidence is the contract and uh, the original must be presented under the best evidence rule the best evidence is the document itself so if a question is being asked uh, which is already which is contained uh, in the contract and uh, the issue is the content of the contract the best evidence is the contract now under the best evidence rule it is the original the signed duplicate original the original must be presented subject to exceptions where the original contract may be proven by secondary evidence by a xerox copy by one who made the xerox and who has read the original and can testify that the xerox is a faithful re reproduction of the original even if the no copy is uh, available, then one who has read uh, and is familiar with the contents of the documents may testify. Now, a, a question in uh, uh, testamentary disposition, special proceedings, may a lost holographic will uh, be probated. The answer uh, as a general rule is no. Because no uh, attesting witnesses are required in holographic will. 
And since there is no witness, who can prove the contents of the lost holographic will? As long as the holographic will is uh, signed and uh, dated and written entirely in the handwriting of the testator, that is valid. How can you prove the genuineness and due execution of a holographic will by secondary evidence? Exception. Where there is a Xerox copy and uh, uh, one who has read the holographic will can testify that the Xerox copy is a faithful reproduction because he was the one who copied it and he has read the lost original. So he can testify on the contents. But other than that, a lost holographic will may not be accepted for probate. Now, uh, Qualification of a witness. A witness must be capable of perceiving and uh, being able to perceive may communicate his perception. A question. May a blind person be qualified to be a witness. When I am conducting a bar review lecture or uh, even in mandatory legal education, when the session is becoming dreary, I crack jokes because uh, when you say, all right, all right, you are sleepy now, let us have an intermission. Uh, jokes, jokes, and all of a sudden, everybody wakes up and becomes alert to listen to the joke involving a a blind witness. So, it is a rape case and uh, the prosecution offers a blind witness to be a witness for the prosecution. The defense counsel objects because a uh, blind witness did not witness or did not see the uh, commission of the rape and the prosecution said under the rules the requirement to qualify a witness is that he must be able to perceive and to communicate his perception and the fiscal said your honor the blind witness is uh, beside the room where the rape was committed and he he heard the incident concerning the rape. So, he should be allowed to testify. Now, there is a, a procedure to test the competency of a witness. Uh, in, in French uh, language, it's called boiré examination. Uh, especially if the witness is a child, and uh, in this particular case, uh, the witness is uh, a blind witness, but who allegedly heard uh, when the rape uh, happened because uh, the rapist was talking uh, and he heard. He may be blind, but uh, he has a very clear uh, hearing uh, ability. 
So the judge called the witness. Let us see. Let us uh, conduct a competency uh, hearing, boy readere examination, to determine whether he is qualified or not. So the accused was uh, required to sit down and to speak. Now, he may not be compelled to give testimonial uh, evidence, but uh, he is not testifying for himself. And uh, anyway, let us uh, disregard the uh, objection to self-incrimination. Uh, just uh, the uh, competency examination uh, took place. And, and so the prosecution uh, uh, presented him as a witness and the judge required the uh, accused to speak. What is your name? My name is uh, uh, Juan de la Cruz. Is that the rapist and uh, the uh, blind uh, witness said, No, Your Honor, that is not the rapist. That is Mickey Mouse. And so the judge said, Oh, I'm telling you, he is not a qualified witness. The trouble with you people, you are trying to present somebody who is blind and uh, who is not an eyewitness. Uh, you may sit down. Uh, and the, the witness said, wait a minute, wait a minute. That was the voice of the rapist referring to the voice of the judge. Maybe it's corny, but uh, anyway, let us uh, continue. When uh, a case in the Sandigan Bayan uh, was a presentation of evidence on a claim against uh, Lucio Tan, claim of ill-gotten wealth that uh, the business, the tobacco business was uh, partly owned by President Marcos. Presid uh, our president now, uh, then a governor, uh, testified on behalf of the prosecution against uh, Lucio Tan, represented by Titong uh, Mendoza. We are part of the defense in that case because our client is Cesar Salamea. When uh, Bongbong Marcos uh, was presented on the witness stand, I requested a boy reader examination to test the competency of uh, Bongbong Marcos to testify. I, I, I said that uh, he is incompetent to testify because he was barely nine years old when the transactions took place between uh, FM and uh, Lucio Tan. And uh, being uh, nine years old, he might not be competent to perceive the transaction and to communicate his perception. So that was my basis. When uh, you say the witness is incompetent to testify. It has nothing to do with his ability. Uh, one time, my uh, co-counsel uh, bought San Juan in uh, CSIP uh, law office in a trial, uh, in, a, in a case against Shell. The 
executive of the shell uh, of, of shell was uh, being cross examined and uh, there was uh, an objection on our side that the witness is incompetent to testify the witness got mad how dare you accuse me of being incompetent i have a phd uh, in business but that is not the meaning of uh, being incompetent. Being uh, incompetent means he has no personal knowledge and uh, he is not competent to testify. And then uh, I, I raised this issue that since the subject matter is the estate of uh, President Marcos, then the, the son cannot testify against the interest of his father in the case and uh, that is allowed uh, and, and that is uh, provided in the rules. The case was uh, reset for the following day. And uh, I did not want to be hard on uh, Governor Marcos, so I just sent my uh, my daughter, who was a new lawyer, a new graduate, to do the cross examination. So she went there. I did not appear, but. Uh, she was very friendly to Tito Mendoza, and Tito Mendoza was very friendly to her. And also, she was uh, naturally friendly also with uh, with the president during that hearing. And so, uh, cross examination on behalf of Cesar Salomea for the witness for the prosecution in the person of BBM. Uh, first question by my daughter. In all the documents that uh, you brought from Hawaii concerning this present case, will you please tell the court whether the name of uh, Mr. Salamea appeared in any of those documents? Uh, answer, no. The names of Mr. Salamea did not appear in any of those documents. And then uh, question number two. Do you know Mr. Cesar Salamea personally? Yes, he was former uh, chairman of the DBP. From your own uh, personal knowledge, do you agree with me that uh, Mr. Cesar Salamea is, a, is an honest man and did not steal a single centavo from the government? Yes, I agree with you. Last question. And you agree with me that Mr. Cesar Salamea has no participation in the subject matter of this case in any way? Yes, I agree. Thank you, Governor Marcos. I think you have just acquitted my client. Titong Mendoza uh, told my daughter, do not uh, file the murder to evidence. We will just submit the case. I will uh, just mark evidence and uh, submit based on documentary evidence. Anyway, uh, our documentary evidence is very strong. We did not agree. We filed a demurrer to evidence when the prosecution uh, rested. So, uh, we, were, uh, we were given, uh, we were granted leave to file the murder to evidence and we filed the murder to evidence for lack of probable cause, lack of participation. As uh, testified by uh, no less than the witness for the prosecution, the son of uh, 
or rather uh, President Marcos. When uh, Tito Mendoza rested the case, the brother of Lucio Tan uh, whispered to the prosecutor, let us file rebuttal evidence, I will testify. I do not know what happened, but uh, we, uh, after filing the, the moral to evidence, we just waited for the resolution. And as expected, we got a dismissal on a uh, motion to dismiss for uh, on the moral to evidence. And the dismissal uh, is based on the cross-examination elicited by, uh, by my daughter. So we got the dismissal ahead. And uh, the case uh, continued for one more year. We did not know what happened, but uh, since uh, our client Cesar Salamea was already of the home, but uh, we, we knew that the case uh, is still dragged on. And so my daughter was uh, very happy because that was uh, her uh, first case uh, after graduation. And uh, she uh, sent by email to all her friends the order of dismissal on her uh, first case in the Sandigan Bayan. Now, let us go to part two, uh, appellate practice. Just remember that appeal is a state, statutory right. It is not a component of uh, due process. It becomes a, uh, it is not an inherent component of uh, due process. It becomes an, a component of due process where it is provided by statute. And so the Resolution of a motion for reconsideration is a component of a due process of law protected by the Constitution and where appeal is uh, provided by statute. Now, only final and executory decision may be uh, appealed. Dismissal with prejudice is a final and executory order or decision. Dismissal without prejudice is not appealable by ordinary appeal. It is appealable or rather reviewable only on grave abuse of discretion or lack or excess of jurisdiction under Rule 65. An order of execution as a general rule is not appealable. However, as an exception, where the order of execution varies the terms and tenor of the uh, final and executory uh, judgment being implemented by the rate of execution, then uh, that is appealable. So I repeat, order of execution as a general rule, not appealable, exception, where the order uh, varies the terms and tenor of the uh, judgment. And what is the subject of uh, execution? The dispo dispositive portion. What is contained in the body is only a narration of facts. What is uh, to be executed is the dispositive portion of the decision. Now, where uh, ownership is vested in one party, then uh, you can request for uh, a writ of uh, possession because uh, possession is an inherent uh, right of ownership. What are the post-judgment uh, remedies other than appeal? 
uh, this is included in the syllabus, so a question is likely to be asked on this. The first is petition for relief from judgment. Where, for example, uh, an order of final dismissal appealable in nature. You fail to file a motion for reconsideration or an appeal. And uh, of course, after the exp expiry of the uh, period to appeal, it has become final. Now, a petition for relief may be filed against a final order or uh, judgment within uh, within 60 days uh, actually uh, there are uh, two uh, two period that must be reckoned with within two months from the issue ones uh, within two months from uh, learning uh, about the the order and six months from the issuance of the order and the uh, ground is uh, fraud accident mistake or excusable negligence there are two kinds of uh, fraud extrinsic and intrinsic Extrinsic is uh, outside the proceedings. Intrinsic is uh, inside the proceedings. So a petition for relief is available only in uh, courts below uh, the Court of Appeals. It is not available in the Court of Appeals. And petition for relief is a prohibited pleading in the first level court uh, in uh, forcible entry and unlawful detainer uh, uh, under the rules on uh, summary procedure. A judgment that is uh, final and executory may be the subject of a petition for annulment, an original action before the uh, uh, Court of Appeals based on lack of uh, jurisdiction. And uh, extrinsic uh, fraud. Now, another uh, post-judgment uh, remedy uh, which is not uh, in the nature of a regular appeal is uh, a special civil action of certiorari prohibition and mandamus under Rule 65. Again, uh, rather I uh, would like to reiterate the grounds under Rule 65. Lack or excess of jurisdiction, grave abuse of uh, discretion. And a distinction uh, must be made between error in judgment and error in jurisdiction. Error in uh, jurisdiction is reviewable by special civil action of certiorari under Rule 65. Error in judgment that is in the appreciation of evidence is appealable only uh, under Rule 40 on ordinary appeal. It is a requirement in uh, petition for uh, certiorari, prohibition and bandamos under Rule 65 that there is no appeal nor any speedy and adequate remedy in the ordinary course of law. So that is the last allegation that should be included 
in the body of the petition. Now, if uh, you are asking for uh, uh, provisional uh, 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 relief, like uh, temporary restraining order, writ of possession, writ of attachment, then uh, it is uh, included in the petition for certiorari showing the uh, clear legal right to the relief of uh, to the relief demanded, and it consists in uh, restraining or preventing the uh, defendant uh, from doing an act which uh, would uh, cause irreparable damage and irremediable uh, uh, injury and uh, to be able to obtain a temporary restraining order, you should show uh, the special urgency. For example, the act is being committed or is about to be committed. Now, in uh, the first level court on the, uh, under Rule 70 for uh, forcible entry and unlawful detainer. A provisional remedy of uh, temporary restraining order or writ of injunction is available only to prevent further disposition. It is not a remedy to recover uh, possession because in our uh, legal system, the recovery of possession is allowed only under specific terms. Uh, for example, uh, declaratory relief is not a ground to recover uh, real estate property. What are the remedies to recover real estate properties under our legal system. Only in specific instances, uh, forcible entry and unlawful detainer. Now, there is forcible entry if the deprivation of uh, property is committed by uh, fraud strategy and stilt and force force strategy and still. And uh, in unlawful detainer, where there is uh, a uh, lease contract and the, con uh, the lease has expired or there is a violation of the lease contract. Now, the jurisdictional uh, element here is that uh, the case must be filed within one year from the disposition or illegal withholding of property. And uh, in the case of uh, forcible entry and unlawful detainer, it is an indispensable requirement that the plaintiff must prove prior possession that was taken by force, strategy, or still. Prior possession is a requirement. And where the deprivation of property took many years, more than one year, by fraud, strategy, or still, the court under uh, the first level court, under Rule 70, has no jurisdiction because jurisdiction is conferred by law and jurisdiction is determined by the allegations in the complaint. So. It must be shown that the case has been filed within one year from the uh, deprivation of property by fraud strategy or, uh, or still in forcible entry. In unlawful detainer, there must be a lease that has expired and uh, the, uh, there is uh, a requisite that there must be a demand and the demand 
is to pay the arrears and to vacate. If the demand is only to vacate, that is not sufficient to grant uh, or best jurisdiction. Now, where there is no lease, then uh, the other uh, uh, way is uh, where there is uh, possession granted by tolerance. But in uh, jurisprudence, uh, there is a mandatory requirement that uh, the tolerance must be given at the start of the possession. In other words, the possession is granted by the plaintiff to the dependent. So where uh, a, a buyer of a property which has uh, occupants uh, wants to eject the occupant who has been there more than uh, one year, the remedy is action publiciana, which is a plenary action to recover possession withheld for more than one year. And uh, the concept of uh, possession by tolerance uh, requires that the tolerance is granted at the incipiency or the start of the possession. Otherwise, the remedy is uh, action publiciana. And uh, even the owner cannot file an action for unlawful detainer under the summary procedure under Rule 70 before the first level court. If the possession, uh, if the uh, possession has lasted for more than one year. And uh, to circumvent this, uh, it is claimed that uh, possession after buying the property is uh, tolerated because uh, the, the Bendy did not immediately file an action for a local detainer. To my mind, uh, the principle is enshrined and well established in jurisprudence that the tolerance as a uh, ground for a local detainer must uh, be in the incipiency or at the start of the possession. And there are many jurisprudence to that effect. Although there are other decisions, contrary decisions, saying that a buyer uh, who does not uh, file an ejectment suit right away has uh, granted tolerance, but tolerance must be at the start of the possession, and that is uh, clearly embedded in jurisprudence. Appeal from the decision of the Sandigam Bayan. Oh, first, from the decision of the Ombudsman. There is a distinction of the uh, appeal where uh, what is involved is a criminal case for preliminary investigation in con contradistinction to uh, administrative investigation for uh, suspension by the Office of the Ombudsman. The rule is resolution of the Ombudsman in criminal investigation 
is appealable directly to the Supreme Court. Where what is involved is uh, administrative uh, sanction or investigation, the, the appeal by petition for review is with the Court of Appeals. Now, appeal from the adverse resolution of the Office of the Ombudsman to the Supreme Court in criminal cases by ordinary appeal by filing notice of appeal and paying the targeting fee. It is not by uh, special, uh, it is not uh, under Rule 45. I made a mistake of appealing a judgment in a criminal case by the Sandigan Bayan to the Supreme Court by petition for review under Rule 45. That is a wrong remedy. Now, I, I am lucky and my client was lucky because my practice is uh, upon receipt of a uh, uh, resolution, I immediately uh, take action and I, in that case where I made a mistake, I filed a petition uh, for review under Rule 45. Uh, which, because I thought that that was the remedy. And I filed it ahead until I was uh, informed by the clerk of court, a very friendly clerk of court, that I should file a mere notice of appeal. So, if I filed it on the 15th day, wrong remedy, out of time, uh, which would be uh, fatal. So my advice is uh, do not do your pleadings on the last minute because uh, immediately if you, if you prepare uh, the, the pleadings, you can uh, think of more uh, grounds and uh, the human brain works like a computer. You sleep over a problem. In the morning, you have the solution. You uh, subconsciously might be uh, formulating the theory of your case and the grounds for review in a petition for certiorari while you are sleeping, as long as you are thinking about it. That is the beauty and the advantage of preparing pleadings ahead of time. I have never missed a deadline in my whole life because of my training in uh, Sisip Salazar. One who missed a deadline is automatically dismissed from employment. That is how strict they were in Sisip Salazar and I learned a lot of things from them in the uh, practice of law. So I, I have discussed already the appeal under Rule 64 from COA and the COMELEC. 30 days. Uh, if you file it beyond 30 days, uh, it may be fatal to your case. Jurisdiction over crimes committed by public uh, officers. Uh, the jurisdiction of the Sandigan Bayan is uh, well defined in law. If the public official has a salary grade uh, below grade 27, the uh, if the offense is uh, punishable by the penalties uh, above uh, the maximum of uh, prison correctional over six years, jurisdiction is vested with the RTC. 
if the imposable penalty for the offense committed by a public uh, officer with salary grade uh, below 27, the imposable penalty uh, does not exceed uh, the maximum of uh, prison correctional, six years, then the jurisdiction is uh, with the uh, first level court. Now, uh, in a decision that uh, was rendered by the RTC against a public officer with salary grade below 27, where is the appeal to uh, multiple choice? Let us say that uh, it is a, uh, a murder case committed by a police, chief of police, or by, by a policeman whose uh, salary is below salary grade 27, and he is convicted of murder. Crimes committed in relation to one's office. He shot somebody with a uh, uh, gun uh, assigned to him. Where, uh, where should be the appeal? It is not to the Court of Appeals, it is not to the Supreme Court. The appeal is by petition for review to the uh, Sandigan Bayan. That is by express provision of the law, creating the Office of the Ombudsman and the Sandigan Bayan. And then the appeal from an adverse uh, resolution of the uh, Sandigan Bayan in the exercise of appellate jurisdiction is to the Supreme Court. So I have told you the story of my case involving uh, four responding police officers and uh, that is the appeal, the proper appeal is to the Sandigan Bayan. Jurisdiction of the Court of Tax Appeals. In uh, criminal cases where uh, the amount involved in tax and custom cases is more than is uh, one million or more, then there is original criminal uh, jurisdiction, including preliminary investigation, before the Court of Tax Appeals. Now, on uh, appeal uh, from the adverse resolution of the Bureau of Internal Revenue, or uh, Bureau of the uh, Collector of Customs to the uh, Court of Tax Appeals. In uh, tax cases <coughs> where a, uh, an assessment, uh, a final assessment has been issued that is uh, appealable by protest to the Commissioner of Internal Revenue. Now, if uh, it is the assistant of the Commissioner of Internal Revenue uh, that uh, decided the case, you can uh, still file a motion for reconsideration with the uh, Commissioner of Internal Revenue. And uh, from there, uh, you have the right of appeal to the Court of Tax Appeal, uh, which will be decided by a division, and still there is an appeal to the in-bank from, from the decision of a uh, uh, 
division. And from the decision of the Court of Tax Appeals in Bank, uh, I petition an appeal by petition for review under Rule 45 is available to the Supreme Court. Now, where the protest uh, is filed uh, with the uh, I, I, I protest uh, is served, notice of assessment is served, and so I, I protest uh, might, be, might be made, might, might be filed with the uh, commissioner. Where the commissioner or uh, the assistant of the commissioner fails to act on the protest for 180 days from the filing of the protest or uh, from the submission within 60 days of the required uh, supporting documents. And after the lapse of 180 days, the taxpayer may appeal to the Court of Tax Appeals or wait for the decision of the uh, commissioner and even if it is beyond 180 days then there is an appeal within 15 days to the uh, Court of Tax Appeals and the procedure in the Court of Tax Appeals is uh, applicable to the procedure in ordinary courts in uh, under uh, Rule 65 and uh, also the Rule on Appeal and uh, the petition for review of the adverse uh, resolution of the uh, Court of Tax Appeals to the Supreme Court under Rule 45. So here, appeals to the Court of Tax Appeals in Bank within 15 days from receipt of the decision of the Court of Tax Appeals Division on Civil and Criminal Cases, where an MR was filed and denied. within 30 days from the decision of Central Board of Assess, Assess Appeal on uh, Real Estate uh, Taxation. And then uh, 15 days from RTC to from RTC in the exercise of uh, appellate jurisdiction. And then appeal from the Court of Tax Appeals to the Supreme Court under Rule 50, uh, 45, 15 days. It is included in the syllabus. What is the harmless error rule? Well, it is an error uh, or defects which does not affect the substantive rights of the accused. However, if uh, there is defiance or uh, malicious uh, refusal, to follow an order, that is a ground for uh, dismissal of the appeal. I have, I inherited a case where uh, the appeal was uh, made to the Court of Appeals from an adverse uh, decision of the Regional Trial Court. The appeal was made in time the uh, appellant's brief was filed in time, but the lawyer uh, failed to inform the court of when the appeal, uh, when the appeal, 
appellant's brief was filed because uh, the one who filed the appeal in the procedure in the Court of Appeals is required within five days to manifest the receipt of the decision. The lawyer failed to uh, comply with that order. And uh, as you know, uh, it is a COVID pandemic. However, the appellee uh, already filed a, an appellee's brief. So it, it would have been a harmless error on the part of the counsel for the appellant not to have notified the, the court of uh, when he when the other party received the uh, appellant's brief. The Court of Appeals dismissed the case for non-compliance with the rule to inform the Court of Appeals when the other party received the appellant's brief for purposes of counting the period to file the appellant's brief. Motion for reconsideration denied. The case was uh, appealed on uh, petition for review under Rule 45 on the ground that uh, it was uh, a harmless error because it affects the su substantive rights of the appellant. And not only that, it is a harmless error because anyway, uh, the date of receipt of the appellant's brief by the appellee's lawyer is already immaterial because the lawyer for the appellee has already filed a, uh, an, appell an appellee's brief. The motion for reconsideration uh, was denied and now the case is in the Supreme Court. Uh, it is not a case of uh, appeal filed out of time, which uh, if you show that the case is deserving of uh, being uh, reviewed on the merit, may even be dispensed with even uh, rule of most mandatory nature must yield to the merit and substantial uh, justice involved in the case because uh, a rule of most mandatory a most man, a, a mandatory rule of procedure may be excused to serve the best interest of justice so harmless uh, error rule refers to error or defect which does not affect the substantive rights of the parties and therefore must be disregarded unless refusal to obey the rule is uh, unreasonable and uh, contrary to substantial justice. And uh, the harmless uh, error rule is applicable in er every stage of the proceeding. Now, uh, when may a, the appellate court, the Court of Appeals or the Supreme Court, rule on an issue that was not raised in the lower court. The requirement of uh, exercise of discretionary power of the Supreme Court on uh, high and mighty constitutional issues affecting public interest of transcendental importance to the nation 
it must be raised uh, at the earliest opportunity. It must be the very uh, less muta presented, meaning that it is the important issue raised in the lower court. And that the constitutional issue, and uh, rather the issue, cannot be resolved without passing upon the high and mighty constitutional issue. These are the uh, requirements. As an exception to serve the best interest of justice, even uh, an issue that has not been raised in the lower court in certain uh, extremely meritorious circumstances may be entertained on appeal. And uh, what are these? Issues involving jurisdiction over the subject matter. And uh, jurisdiction is uh, conferred by law. And so jurisdiction over the subject matter may be raised at any stage of the proceeding. Plain and clerical error, even if not raised uh, below, may be uh, considered. To avoid multiplicity of suits and to serve the best interest of justice. So, in many cases where there is inordinate delay in the uh, proceeding, the Supreme Court may decide to rule on the merit uh, in order to uh, serve the best interest of justice and avoid multiplicity of suit, where uh, it can... Uh, clearly uh, be uh, decided uh, based on jurisprudence, uh, based on applicable law and jurisprudence. An example, in Supina versus De La Rosa, uh, a, a judge, uh, an RTC judge, uh, enjoined the foreclosure of extra uh, the extrajudicial foreclosure of real estate mortgage. Uh, on petition of a junior incumbrancer. And uh, the Supreme Court said that uh, it is a plain error. And where the uh, law violated is basic and fundamental, it constitutes gra grave uh, gross error or uh, gross ignorance of the law. And so the judge was suspended. And at the same time, instead of remanding the case to the lower court, the Supreme Court decided on the issue because the facts and the law are clear, although that is not the subject of the uh, petition in the High Court. And the Supreme Court said that uh, when a, an extrajudicial foreclosure uh, is uh, conducted, all the junior incumbrancer shall be erased because their only right is to exercise the equity of redemption. The foreclosing party, the mortgagor, has the right to have the title uh, registered in its name and uh, all the junior incumbrancer like a uh, rate of attachment are subordinate to the right of the mortgagor because their only right is uh, to exercise the equity of redemption that is uh, a junior incumbrancer uh, holder of uh, an attachment or a levy uh, may uh, exercise the right of redemption by paying uh, the winning party. And other than that, uh, the winning party is entitled uh, to have issuance of a title without carrying over the uh, annotations of the junior incumbrancer. So th that is the rule now being followed by all the register of deeds following that decision in Supina versus uh, De La Rosa.
Now, if an issue is raised in the trial court, but not raised on appeal, may the appellate court resolve the issue? The answer is yes, because the, the facts are already there in the evidence. And so that is within the discretionary power of the appellate court to decide. And uh, I came across a decision where uh, a change of jury may be allowed on appeal, where uh, the facts and the law uh, are applicable under the new jury. So the jury of the case may even be uh, altered or modified on appeal, uh, provided that uh, the factual uh, background and the applicable law have been uh, or the, uh, are, uh, are available on appeal. Now, an, an uh, issue that is not uh, raised in the appeal may be considered if it is intertwined or closely related to the issue raised on appeal. Catholic Bishop of Balanga versus CA. Now, appeal in capital offenses. Jurisdiction of uh, the uh, appellate jurisdiction in capital offenses. Whereas before, the appeal is direct to the Supreme Court where capital punishment is imposed. Under the doctrine of hierarchy of courts, the appeal should be with the Court of Appeals, even in capital uh, offenses, uh, which is now punishable only by reclusion perpetua, 12 years and one day to 40 years. No more uh, death penalty. So where uh, what is involved is a capital offense. The appeal from the regional trial court should be to the Court of Appeals. The Court of Appeals will review the case. Where the Court of Appeals uh, finds that uh, the appellant should be acquitted, the Court of Appeals shall render a decision of acquittal and remand the case for execution uh, to the uh, Court of Origin. Where the finding of the Court of Appeals in the review on capital cases is to affirm the judgment of conviction, the Court of Appeals will make a report and uh, recommend to the Supreme Court the affirmance. And it is up to the Supreme Court to decide what to do, whether to acquit or to affirm. And that uh, is in consonance with the hierarchy of courts. Before you go to the Supreme Court, the normal and ordinary procedure is passed through the Court of Appeals. Now, on special civil action under Rule 65, uh, certiorari prohibition and uh, mandamus, please uh, take note that in mandamus, it is only a specific duty enjoined by court, uh, enjoined by law, that may be the subject of a petition for mandamus, where what is involved is a dis discretionary uh, duty or function. It cannot be compelled by mandamus. However, the remedy is uh, certiorari where uh, the action is tainted with grave abuse of discretion or uh, lack or excess of jurisdiction, where uh, you can nullify the acts. But uh, to compel a specific action, 
only uh, duty or obligation that is specifically enjoined by law may be the subject of uh, mandamus. When I filed on my own behalf, a petition for mandamus against the JBC, uh, which is now in jurisprudence, Arturo M. De Castro versus uh, JBC, to compel the JBC to submit to President Gloria Macapagal Arroyo the nominees for uh, three nominees for uh, Chief Justice during the election ban within uh, two months immediately preceding the election, uh, which by express uh, literal language of the Constitution is prohibited. So I filed the case. The Supreme Court noted that uh, a petition for mandamus will not lie against the JBC to exercise a discretionary power. However, I still uh, obtain the relief uh, by a declaration that uh, the ban against uh, appointment uh, during uh, two months immediately preceding the election does not apply to appointment to the judiciary because my contention particularly to the justices of the Supreme Court and uh, how much more for the Chief Justice because the appointment will not influence the election and uh, the uh, purpose of the ban is to avoid uh, election uh, influencing the election and so I got the ruling and uh, Corona was uh, appointed during the period of the election ban. It is just too bad that I was not allowed to appear for uh, Corona, uh, Chief Justice Corona in the impeachment because uh, I was uh, instrumental in uh, his appointment as Chief Justice and the panel of lawyers declined my offer to appear as a uh, counsel for uh, uh, Chief Justice uh, Corona. Chief Justice uh, Renato Corona uh, was my uh, office mate in the Commercial Bank of Manila. Early on, I was the uh, senior vice president and corporate secretary of the Commercial Bank of Manila. He, was, he started as uh, a manager in the bank, but then uh, when I left, he rose uh, in the ranks and I am not sure whether he took over my position, but uh, he was uh, then transferred to the legal office in Malacanang. I wish I could have uh, handled the case for him because uh, my perception is after the prosecution rest, he should not have testified. He should have filed a demurrer to evidence. Because when he testified, then there was uh, a perception that he provided the evidence against himself by admitting the dollar deposit, which initially could not be uh, probed because the Supreme Court held that is subject by, by uh, the rule on confidentiality. But uh, anyway, uh, let us uh, procedure in the Supreme Court. Where uh, 
ay case is decided by a division. It is not appealable to the in-bank. But there are uh, grounds allowed to file a second motion for reconsideration and uh, to request that it be heard by the uh, Supreme Court in Bank. One ground is where there are conflicting decisions among the divisions of the Supreme Court. It is only the in Bank that can uh, reconcile and harmonize which is the correct decision of the two conflicting decisions rendered by the different div divisions. And uh, another uh, is uh, where, uh, for example, uh, the subject matter is uh, of great economic value, then it deserves the attention of the uh, Supreme Court in Bank. Other, other grounds uh, where uh, under facts and circumstances uh, meritorious in character, the uh, case deserves to be uh, reviewed by the Supreme Court in Bank. The only problem is uh, the motion the second motion for reconsideration usually is left to the same division that rendered the decision to decide whether to elevate to the in-bank or not. So your case might just be killed in the division without reaching the uh, uh, in-bank because I do not know. Uh, it, it seems it is discretionary to the division to elevate the case to the in-bank. I tried even on the first motion for reconsideration to bring the case to the in-bank because of conflicting decisions. That uh, the decision in the case that I am handling is contrary to other decisions uh, rendered by the Supreme Court. But then uh, it is the same division that rendered the uh, adverse decision that is uh, allowed or has the discretion whether to uh, elevate the case to in-bank or not. But if it is of uh, great uh, importance to the nation, then uh, the Supreme Court may take a second look. In the case of Manoto versus Barque, this is a special land registration case where uh, the land registration case issued a reconstituted title in the name of uh, Hernandez Barque. Against uh, the title, of uh, uh, Manoto Realty Corporation. So the, the case uh, reached the Court of Appeals. In the Court of Appeals, the president of Manoto uh, Subdivision uh, consulted me and I agreed to handle the case. However, the final decision is that uh, it was uh, uh, assigned to another lawyer. I will not mention the name. The decision in favor of Barque uh, was upheld by the Court of Appeals. Motion for reconsideration denied the Manotok uh, Realty uh, elevated the case to the Supreme Court. In the third division, 
the case was decided in favor of uh, Barque. Motion for reconsideration denied and uh, there was an entry of final judgment. However, the Supreme Court in Bank under uh, Chief Justice uh, Panganiban decided to take a second look of the case. An oral argument was scheduled. The the group of Barke, uh, whose lawyer was my compadre, came to me and asked me to represent them and argue the case uh, before the Supreme Court orally. But uh, I, I cannot do that. Not only because I was scheduled to go abroad at that time, I was consulted previously by the uh, Manotok Realty Corporation. So I, I cannot, although uh, la later on, I was approached again uh, to handle the case, but this time I cannot uh, help them anymore because I was consulted by the other party based on conflict of interest. And uh, they even asked the permission of Justice Feliciano, who was uh, representing them at that time, whether I can be uh, a collaborating counsel. And Justice uh, Feliciano agreed that I may collaborate because I work as his assistant in CSIP Salazar. But I cannot collaborate because of conflict of interest. So what happened was that uh, after the oral argument, the Supreme Court uh, referred the case for hearing to the Court of Appeals on the issue of uh, which of the two titles the title of uh, Barke as against the title of uh, Manotok have a trace back to the original decree of registration because uh, the established jurisprudence is where there are two titles. Uh, the uh, validity may be uh, determined first uh, under the <coughs> first to file rule. So the earlier uh, resolution or the early, earlier uh, title has, uh, will prevail over the latest title. So that is the first to file rule. But then, if uh, there are questions on the uh, origin of the title, then the test is uh, to have a trace back to the original decree, and the one that has a valid trace back is the uh, valid title. So there was a uh, hearing in the Court of Appeals that was conducted in uh, 2012 the supreme court issued a uh, resolution and uh, you can read this in the case of uh, parque versus uh, manotok uh, a decision of the court in bank uh, in the case and the ruling is this since the title of uh, Barke and the title of uh, Manotok do not have a trace back to the original decree. They are both null and void. So this is the only case for the first time in my more than 50 years of law practice that a case was declared a draw. No, nobody won. And uh, consider that uh, this is a very valuable property uh, where uh, the Manotok family have five mansions. 
uh, just uh, at the back of uh, UP on Commonwealth Avenue. So that was the ruling. Neither of them. So what, what, what is the remedy now? Then who, who, who can perfect the title will be the owner. Because neither one is confirmed to have a valid title. But then what will come into play is who is in actual possession. And uh, in the recent amendments during the, uh, towards the end of the Duterte administration, uh, the uh, period of uh, possession adverse to the whole world, against the whole world, was reduced from 30 days to uh, 20 days. And I do not know what is the status of the case because uh, I have information that it is still pending reconsideration. But uh, considering that uh, no uh, decision has so far been made on any uh, reconsideration that I know of, uh, then probably considering 2012 to 2022, 10 years, then the w w whatever objection or reconsideration might have been considered denied sub silencio for failure to act on it for a long period of time. But I do not know. The last say is uh, with the Supreme Court. But you can read the decision, and if it is subject to a motion for uh, reconsideration, I am not uh, aware of the status. Now, let us go to uh, legal ethics. In practically most of the bar examinations, the examinee is asked to state or recite the lawyer's oath. Because the lawyer's oath contains the manifold duties of a lawyer to society, the government, obey the constitution and the orders of the duly constituted uh, authorities. The duty to the client, the, the duty to the profession, never to sue upon groundless or unlawful suit. The duty, of, uh, the duty to the court and uh, the duty to uh, the profession, the uh, fellow practitioners. So please memorize the lawyer's oath. Baratri. What is Baratri? Uh, inciting and stirring up quarrels and suits, fomenting suits and litigation among individuals and offering his legal services. Ambulance chasing, uh, soliciting uh, legal business. It is uh, an ethical for a lawyer to engage agents to solicit uh, legal business and pay uh, a portion to the soliciting agents uh, and the question has been uh, 
raised in an actual case by a lawyer work for a collection agency who is soliciting uh, legal business among banks and lenders. It is unethical for a lawyer to work for a collection agency who is soliciting uh, business for uh, uh, collecting uh, loans uh, by a decision of the Supreme Court. And it is uh, even uh, unethical to be soliciting business by uh, bragging about connections. That is not uh, allowed. I know a former uh, uh, RTC judge who was suspended on complaint by uh, Harry Roque on behalf of uh, a uh, neighborhood association because the former judge has a calling card which states former CFI judge and uh, for that he was suspended by the Supreme Court for life. He was disbarred for uh, uh, distributing a uh, calling card stating that uh, he was a former uh, CFI judge. Now, where a disbarment has been meted out, there is a remedy for a disbarred uh, lawyer to be reinstated with his license. If he make amends for his uh, mistakes and uh, if uh, uh, he has shown that he has uh, been morally rehabilitated. An example is uh, siring children out of wedlock oh, no. uh, with another woman while, while married. If the uh, disbarred lawyer will show that he supported the illegitimate children, sent them to school, gave them uh, proper support and education, and uh, he has... Uh, led a moral life, he has uh, joined the Corsillo movement and uh, he became a member, uh, let us say, Knight of Columbus uh, and he can prove to the Supreme Court that uh, he has been morally rehabilitated. He can be reinstated in the uh, practice of law. There used to be a distinction between gross immorality and simple Im immorality, but I believe that uh, such distinction has been uh, erased now, maybe during the time of Justice Fernando where uh, justices I, I knew then were engaging in immorality and they were uh, not uh, available, uh, they, they were not uh, ethically uh, liable because uh, what was uh, committed was only uh, simple immorality. 
where uh, an RTC judge has been removed for immorality, being married, maintaining a mistress. And the judge is uh, removed from service with forfeiture of uh, uh, benefits, like retirement benefits, SSS uh, benefits. Under the civil code, where uh, conjugal partnership of gain is the property relationship between the judge and the wife, is it not uh, unjust, oppressive, and violation of due process and deprivation of property rights of the wife to forfeit all the uh, benefits earned by the errant judge who is uh, separated from the service for maintaining a mistress. Because the forfeiture should apply only to uh, the share in the conjugal partnership of gains of the errant uh, husband. In the case of Judge Kalanog of Quezon City, the uh, family, the legitimate family, were uh, allowed by the Supreme Court to get uh, one half of the retirement pay, retirement uh, benefits of the dismissed judge on the ground that the forfeiture would be grossly unjust to the innocent uh, spouse. So I, I believe that that is uh, a uh, just and valid uh, claim. Now, conflict of uh, interest should be avoided because that is a ground for uh, disciplinary action. So, a, a lawyer who prepared a deed of sale cannot be a lawyer for either the seller or the buyer uh, to file a case for uh, rescission of contract. However, the rule specifically allows the lawyer who prepared the documents to give an advice to, for the protection of the uh, substantive rights of a party. But he cannot handle the case. The only uh, thing he can do is uh, give an advice. Let me see. Bautista versus Barrios, uh, Administrative Case 258, December 21, 1963. He can give legal advice only to the extent necessary to safeguard the rights of the parties. That's the only thing that, uh, that he can do. And I, I know here, cannot work for uh, a collection uh, agency that solicits uh, legal business to collect loans. And that is the case of Santiago versus Rapanal. I encountered the case of a uh, friend in Tabau. He represented a client in a collection suit. There was a compromise agreement uh, to pay the loan on installment. On the first installment, the lawyer applied it to his attorney's fees. He was suspended by the Supreme Court for six months for an ethical uh, conduct. 
He filed a motion for reconsideration. The suspension was increased to uh, two years. What is uh, difficult about suspension? Let us say that uh, the suspension is uh, for three months. It is enough that you have served out the suspension. The Supreme Court, which is the final uh, arbiter on disciplinary action of lawyers, should uh, lift the suspension order. And before that, you cannot practice. That has happened to me. I was uh, suspended for three months for delaying a case. I was uh, usually late because I came from Metro Manila and the case uh, has been new in Batanga City. When the oral argument on my petition for mandamus against the JVC to compel the JVC to send three nominees for uh, Chief Justice, the case was uh, scheduled on the same day that uh, I had a hearing in Badangas. I went there, I was late. The case was uh, already uh, Cases were already being called, and I, I was uh, standing there, waiting for my case to be called. I was not told. I waited until 12 o'clock. I did not know that uh, the judge has already dismissed my case. So I missed, I, I missed my chance to argue orally on my petition for mandamus before the Supreme Court. There was a, uh, an order of the judge that I was uh, delaying the case and because uh, probably it was my fault, uh, many times I was uh, late because of traffic and coming from Metro Manila. The defendant, in the case that I was handling, filed a disbarment suit against me and I was uh, suspended for three months. Can you imagine the damage and injury to me? I was uh, removed by uh, the dean of the Ateneo Law School where I was uh, teaching in the graduate school on corporate suspension of payments, uh, also uh, review, and uh, I, I was teaching there for the past uh, 17 years at that time. I, according to uh, the dean, I was suspended and I cannot uh, teach. I cannot practice until the suspension was lifted. So I, I waited for the Supreme Court to either lift my suspension or uh, reconsider the uh, judgment of suspension. Luckily, the judgment of suspension, uh, suspension instead of being lifted was reconsidered and uh, I was given admonition to be more circumspect. And so that is uh, the agony of uh, being suspended. Until the suspension is lifted by the Supreme Court, you cannot practice. You cannot even teach. I was lucky that my suspension was reconsidered by the Supreme Court. 
And in the internet, uh, I, I saw many posts, uh, even when I was already uh, released from suspension by reconsideration, uh, still my detractors were saying, I am a suspended lawyer. When I am uh, posting uh, uh, opinions on current legal events. Now, uh, what is the meaning of quantum meruit in uh, legal fees? The uh, legal compensation must be reduced in writing and the best time to negotiate uh, a contract for legal services is at the beginning so that if you cannot agree then uh, you can uh, refuse however you can refuse you cannot refuse uh, to render a case to an indigent uh, litigant and one is considered indigent if he has no uh, real estate with unassessed value uh, not more than uh, 300,000. Now, can a lawyer uh, terminate the legal services for non-payment of his uh, legal fees? Delay no man for money or malice. So, you cannot deny uh, legal services that you have accepted because you are not being paid. But if the refusal to pay is contumacious, uh, then uh, a lawyer my refuse to uh, render further assistance, but he has to get permission of the court to be relieved of further uh, responsibilities. But in the meantime, you cannot abandon the cause of the client. And uh, normally, you cannot withdraw unless there is a written conformity, unless you have valid grounds like uh, uh, lack of co communication and other uh, valid grounds. But to be relieved of uh, part of the responsibility, uh, you have to uh, file a motion to withdraw before uh, the court, to be approved by the court. The authority of uh, a government official, aside from those who are allowed by the by the constitution, uh, congressmen, senators, an ordinary public officer who is a lawyer, as a general rule, cannot practice, but. Uh, on uh, isolated uh, transaction with the consent of uh, his department head, a government lawyer may uh, handle the case of a relative. But uh, a lawyer who is uh, engaged as uh, a city legal officer or a municipal legal officer, even if he is uh, allowed by the mayor, cannot practice law, cannot handle outside cases. I am handling a case, I, I was uh, handling a case in the Sandigan Bayan, and uh, uh, the court 
learned that uh, the lawyer representing another uh, defendant in the same case is serving was serving as a legal officer of uh, a municipality in Batangas and he was required by the court to withdraw his case and the client is directed to find another uh, lawyer because a government uh, uh, lawyer cannot practice law uh, except on the narrow exception in, in isolated uh, case uh, involving a uh, relative with the uh, approval of the chief of office. Now, what is controversial is whether the government may engage the services of a private uh, lawyer and paid the latter with government funds. This was involved in the case of uh, co-warranto case of uh, former Chief Justice Lourdes uh, Sereno. As uh, a private lawyer in the Piatco cases, she received uh, a sizable amount of money from the government. The Court of Appeals initially allowed the payment of legal fees by the uh, Office of the Solicitor General. Later on, uh, the Court of Appeals, upon uh, reconsideration, uh, disallowed the payment of attorney's fees to Lourdes Sereno. I, if I'm not mistaken, the amount is 34 million or uh, 38 million, uh, which, I, which is which, I am not sure. The final ruling of the Court of Appeals is that engagement of a private lawyer by the government violates the rule on public bidding for uh, services uh, in favor of the government because there are many other lawyers uh, who may be equally competent who were not uh, given a chance in a public bidding and uh, that, that was the uh, decision uh, of the Court of Appeals. And uh, drawing from such uh, decision, a private lawyer cannot be paid with government funds. Under the Constitution, public funds may be disbursed only for public purpose, pursuant to law enacted by Congress. There is uh, a controversial question on that uh, because the BSP is uh, allowed under its charter to engage a private lawyer. And uh, I went to the Supreme Court to question that, to question the constitutionality of the charter of the new uh, BSP under the new BSP law allowing the the bank the central bank to engage the services of private council under the circulars of the COA the government may be allowed to engage the services of uh, private counsel and to pay legal fees to private counsel only where there are no available lawyers in the government who can handle the case and uh, because of special qualifications and expertise there is a necessity to engage the services of a 
private lawyer. That is the only exception. And uh, there is a, a, a case uh, where uh, the municipality uh, in Rizal, who is supposed to be represented by the provincial fiscal in a case, uh, engaged the services of a private lawyer because there was no provincial fiscal to represent him. And uh, that was allowed under the COA circular based on absolute uh, necessity. So, the engagement of a private lawyer is still up for decision in the Supreme Court on a uh, direct attack on the constitutionality of the BSP law where uh, in the news report more than 5 billion has been disbursed by the BSP in payment of private lawyers. Many private lawyers, not only one. For room shopping, in the uh, where uh, resort to different uh, fora is resorted to simultaneously or one after the other, uh, other involving the same parties subject matter and issues. Forum shopping may be uh, punishable as contempt of court if done maliciously and the result is the dismissal of both actions. <coughs> In the, this, in the administrative case against uh, public officials, there is a Supreme Court uh, circular that uh, disbarment is impliedly instituted. And uh, disbarment, if warranted, should be included in the decision, in the administrative investigation against a public uh, official who is a lawyer. Also, uh, there is a uh, circular issued by the Supreme Court that uh, filing an administrative uh, complaint against a judge without uh, valid ground is an act of contempt or punishable by contempt if done with malice, malicious uh, intent. Amicus Curie. Amicus Curie simply means friend of the court. When I was uh, a younger lawyer, uh, I was uh, working together with uh, Senator Ambrosio Padilla on uh, several uh, high profile cases, and uh, we even if not invited by the court, would uh, file a motion to be allowed to appear as amicus curiae. And uh, it is discretionary to the court whether to accept us or not. But in the past, uh, my appearance 
was accepted by the Supreme Court and I was allowed to argue or to at least file a legal uh, memorandum. Uh, for example, in the SNAP election cases, I was uh, not invited but uh, I was authorized to appear as a voluntary amicus uh, curiae. And in many other cases. Now, in the case of ABS-CBN, uh, cancellation of uh, franchise that went up to the Supreme Court, I filed a motion to be admitted or to be invited or to be allowed to appear as amicus curiae because I made a special study of the corporation law and the Securities Regulation Act, uh, which I am teaching in the review and uh, in the regular course in the law schools. The Supreme Court did not allow me, did not admit me as amicus uh, curiae. So that is discretionary upon the court. And as a general rule, it is upon invitation. But uh, you may uh, move to appear as voluntary uh, amicus curiae, meaning friend of the court, subject to the discretion of the court. What is the meaning of amicus curiae par excellence? Well, it is appearance of an association, uh, for example, appearance by the integrated bar or appearance by the uh, 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 constitutional association of uh, constitutional or, or, or whatever uh, association, legal association appearing as uh, amicus curiae a lawyer may be disciplined for taking an inconsistent inconsistent stand that's why in the case i handled for uh, senator miriam defensor santiago uh, on the legalization of 32 uh, alien uh, Chinese citizens. Initially, I filed a motion to quash in the lower court that the information charges 32 or more than one information. I was uh, sustained by the uh, Sandigam Bayan, chaired by Francis Garcitorena. And uh, the prosecutor, uh, Simeon Ferrer, uh, amended and filed 32 information. So I still maintain uh, that the 32 information should be quashed. And I contradicted myself by saying that uh, it should be in only one information because it is a continuing offense. The case went up to the Supreme Court and I cannot forcefully agree that, uh, rather argue that uh, it is uh, a uh, continuing offense because I had an inconsistent stand before and uh, knowing very well that it is a bit unethical to uh, argue uh, against a former uh, stand. The Supreme Court upheld uh, my uh, weak uh, argument that it is a continuing offense uh, that is motivated by one uh, criminal design.
Now, double jeopardy does not apply in disbarment. Why? Because disbarment is so generis. It is a class by itself. And it is neither criminal nor civil. Where uh, even a uh, prejudicial question would be applicable. The Supreme Court is very strict when it uh, comes to the uh, breach of fiduciary duty of a uh, lawyer. A lawyer is like an agent uh, with, uh, with uh, involved with highly uh, fiduciary duty. And uh, under Article 1491 of the Civil Code, a lawyer cannot acquire property in litigation subject to two exceptions. One, in case of con contingent fee arrangement, where uh, a uh, poor litigant May, may avail of uh, contingency fee arrangement to pay a portion of the property recovered or uh, sum of money uh, recovered. And the other exception uh, laid down by uh, jurisprudence is where the case is already terminated, then uh, the lawyer may buy the subject matter of the property once it is already terminated. So it's already five o'clock. My uh, notes, study guide in uh, criminal law and in mercantile law are uh, already printed uh, and available at the central books. And uh, we will see if we can uh, distribute this in the various uh, Bar Review Centers, uh, Mercantile Law Review and uh, Criminal Law Review. Since my start of uh, handling uh, review, although I handle updates on all subjects, I have been, I always concentrate on Mercantile Law Review and Civil Law Review because these are the most difficult uh, questions in the bar. At the time that uh, the coverage are not narrowed down in the syllabus as now, mercantile law has a uh, vast coverage. Can you imagine uh, we have the uh, Code of Commerce, uh, we have uh, negotiable instruments, uh, insurance, uh, intellectual property code consisting of three volumes. So mercantile law, uh, which were uh, scheduled uh, before on the third Sunday, uh, is given uh, when uh, most of the examin examinees are already tired. So I concentrated in my uh, review in handling uh, review classes even in UP, in Ateneo, and uh, in the other uh, downtown school on these two subjects. And I handled them in the regular four-year review, both in UP and uh, in uh, Ateneo and in the UP Law Center. So I 
uh, gave priority to uh, for the national book store to be able to finish this and uh, with uh, all the cases that I am handling now uh, I doubt if I can uh, still uh, catch up with the November bar examination for the other subjects but I am going to give a lecture next time, next Saturday, on uh, political law and labor. I have the materials prepared uh, in outline form for this, but I doubt if I can still make publication other than mercantile and uh, criminal law. So, I will uh, have uh, political law and uh, public international law and labor uh, next uh, uh, sessions. But I assure you, I will be available for you in the pre-week in uh, November. And uh, we will be uh, dealing with uh, the significant and important uh, principles in political law and uh, public international law. So, thank you for uh, listening to me. I will see you next Saturday again, 1 to 5, on political law, public international law, and labor. Thank you for listening to me.